on the cliffs of eastern Yucatan still stands the walled city of Tulum, the first of the great Maya metropolises seen by the Spanish conquerors in 1518. One of their priests wrote of it, towards sunset we saw a burg or town, so large that Seville could not have been larger or better. We saw there a very high tower. Tulum was only one of many such cities. Across Yucatan to Mexico, down into Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, the Maya built thousands of ceremonial centers. These are only a few of the most notable. Each contained 10 to 40 or more temples and palaces. And the country that lay between was filled with 30 or 40 times as many cities as are represented by these little pyramids. One of them, Chichen Itza, in northern Yucatan, has been partially restored. And here we get some hint of the extent and the original magnificence of a Maya city. From the top of this hundred-foot pyramid, we see the group of the thousand columns, the temple of the warriors, and the flat jungle beyond. The group of the thousand columns was once roofed over with arches. Upon the top of the second structure was a temple. Columns in the shape of carven snakes flanked the portal of this place of worship. In front of the heads of the snakes is a chakmul, a figure holding on its stomach a plate for offerings. The curling nose of the rain god ornaments the corners of the temple. This round tower has a spiral staircase within it. The position of its windows suggests that it may have been an astronomical observatory. In the older part of Chichen Itza, the buildings are less spectacular in size, but far more richly ornamented. Except for the narrow rooms within, the structures are a solid mass of cement and rubble, almost like concrete, which is faced on the outside with elaborately carved stone. These masks of the rain god are a mosaic of large and small stone blocks cemented into place. One of the most remarkable structures in Chichen is the great ball court, 480 feet long and 120 feet wide. Opposing teams tried to drive a ball of solid rubber through a ring in either of the two long walls or past their opponents. The players could strike the ball only with their hips or shoulders. At moonrise, the pyramid of Kukulkan of the Temple of the Warriors take on an added majesty. Majestic, too, is the pyramid of the magician at neighboring Ushmao. Behind the pyramid lies a quadrangle of palaces now almost completely restored. Stone replicas of Maya huts decorate this wall. Sometimes the ornament is as elaborate as a Chichen. Through an arch, we see the Palace of the Governors, one of the longest and finest Maya buildings. In the foreground, the ruins of a small ball court. From the Palace of the Governors, we see again the Pyramid of the Magician. The government of Mexico is restoring this magnificent monument of ancient Maya civilization. Hundreds of such structures and tens of thousands of smaller buildings still wait restoration. The windy rains of the tropics fed the probing roots of the jungle trees till they slowly pried stone from stone and brought down walls and arches in ruins. Here at Kaba in Yucatan, where brush and trees have been cleared away to lay bare a gigantic pile of rubble, the northern winds and rains spurred on the destructive jungle. But on the other side of this same building, sheltered from the tropical northers, the richly ornamented walls have suffered hardly at all. At Sayil, the jungle has destroyed one half of the largest building in the Maya area, a storied palace of 85 rooms. The Maya arch was not as strong as the Roman, but backed by cement and rubble, it has defied the jungle for a thousand years. In the ceremonial city of Labna, which lies in northern Yucatan, the tropical forest has dealt harshly with many a building, but the largest Maya arch still stands secure, 
16 feet in height and 10 across, the center of what must have been a most impressive structure. In the midst of the heavy jungle of Mexican Chiapas, the Maya arch has preserved many of the jewel-like buildings of Palenque. The carved stucco with which these temples were faced has suffered greatly, but the arches still stand. Here are openings in the inner walls, almost Saracenic in shape. Many of the Maya buildings, like this at Yashchilan, were topped by flying roof combs of intricate pattern. At Copan in Honduras, we see the older type of ball court with slanting walls. This is one of the stairways of the great court at Copan. The highlands of Guatemala, the pyramids of Zaculeu, have been uncovered with the gleaming surface of stucco with which so many Maya buildings were finished. The older Maya structures, such as the arch at Labna, were rich in color and ornament. This is what it may have looked like. The Maya were fine sculptors as well as architects, hewing and grinding stone with stone, for they had no iron or steel. They carved great monoliths and altars, like these at Copan in Honduras. And at Yashchilan, they made this superb figure of a priest masked as a god. With equal skill, these men of the Stone Age made heads and figures of gods and men. And they worked jade, that hard and refractory stone, even more skillfully. They also fashioned lovely figurines of clay, like these from the island of Haina. Their incense burners were often large and always bizarre. Without the aid of the potter's wheel, the Maya made beautiful clay vessels, some painted in colors and some incised with ornaments. They wove cotton cloth, which amazed the Spaniards. This is one of the few bits of ancient textile that have resisted tropic decay. But perhaps the greatest phase of this civilization was intellectual. Carved on this stone are dates in a calendar of their invention which was more accurate than the one Columbus used. To count the days, they studied the movements of the heavenly bodies. Here is their sign for the moon. At Copan, they used two monuments, four miles apart, to observe the setting of the sun on a certain day important to their calendar, the day when corn should be planted. They invented a system of signs and numbers to record significant dates. Besides carving these dates on stone, they inscribed them in books. All but three of these have been destroyed by man and the tropic elements. Only a third of the signs have been deciphered by science. But anyone can read the numerals which helped the Maya to fix their dates accurately through thousands of years. Here is a single dot, which stands for one. A couple of dots make two. Instead of five dots, they used a bar. A bar and four dots make nine. Two bars and four dots, 14. Three bars and four dots, 19. The Maya seem to have invented the idea of zero before it was thought of by the Hindus. The only difficulty is that whereas we advance our numbers by tens, they advance theirs by twenties. Zero at the bottom means no digits. The dot above means one unit in the position used for twenties. The two together make twenty. Here is twenty-one. One dot to indicate a digit, and one above to indicate twenty. Large numbers were easy. Four digits, nine twenties, eight times four hundred, making twenty-nine hundred and eighty-four. What a time the Romans had with a number like that. In the books of the Maya, as well as in their sculpture, they often picture the gods of their pantheon. The figure in the center is Itzamna, the great lord, son of the creator of the world, and the most important of the gods. Here against a red background is the god of the North Star, and therefore of traveling merchants. Of the many deities, the most important in the practical affairs of life were Chak, the god of rain, 
who in this drawing paddles a canoe, and the youthful corn god, whose name we do not know. These two ensured the growth of the maize, or Indian corn, the food upon which the Maya civilization was reared. Time after time, in their books and on their monuments, the Maya pictured this beneficent deity. Here he is sowing corn to preserve his people. We can unroll from their pottery a few scenes that show something of their costumes. But until a recent discovery in the jungles of Chiapas, we had no notable paintings of this ancient life. Scenes like these from Chichen Itza are crude presentations of Maya life after the Mexican invaders had somewhat reshaped it. As to who the Maya were and where their ancestors came from long before the birth of Christ, we have evidence that their descendants today are of the Mongoloid race of Eastern Asia. These living Maya of Mexico have the Mongoloid fold in their eyelids. And their children show at the base of the spine a bluish area, the Mongoloid spot, which disappears after a few years. From Western Asia, across Bering Strait, their ancestors must have followed some such route as this to the part of the New World where they were to build their unique civilization. Today, in the highlands of southern Mexico, much as in Yucatan and Guatemala, the descendants of the Maya live in the shadow of colonial Spain. For it was in 1540 that the conquistadores founded the chief city of this Maya area, now known as San Cristobal Las Casas. Still speaking the Maya tongue, these people come in from their cornlands and small villages to attend market, to sell or trade their wares, and to gossip after the manner of men and women everywhere. And many of them go to the cathedral to worship in Maya. They are more at home, of course, in the little churches of their towns and villages. Wherever they may be, in church, market, cornfield, or village, there's color and glow in their costume their fiestas. And they still live to a surprising extent in the old Maya way. The women still make clay vessels without the potter's wheel of the white man. They polish them with a stone as their ancestors did. While the clay is still moist, they paint it with ornaments. Then, as the Mayas have always done, they pile the pots for the firing, stand logs on end about the pots, and set them afire. The women of these highlands still use the primitive loom of the ancient Maya, and on it they weave the same beautiful fabrics that their ancestors wove. Sometimes they work into the cloth raised design that look like embroidery. Here's one of the finest of the old designs. The Maya of the Highlands are as fond of fiestas as the Indians in any other part of Mexico. Some of their dances and ceremonies are related to the harvest and to primitive religious conceptions that have been handed down through the years. In this fiesta, at Chamula, alien elements have crept in. Parodies of the uniforms of Maximilian's French army and banners made from store-bought cloth. miles away from the highlands of Las Casas, an hour and a half by airplane, but three weeks by muleback, live a Maya people almost untouched by the life and industry of the conquering white man. This is a land of jungle, a rainforest, and within it are a people, the Lacandones, who are truly the living Maya. In their life today, we find decadent vestiges of the ways and the religion of their great ancestors. 
In most respects, these men still live in the Stone Age. They seem as primitive and strange to us as the long gowns that they wear, day and night, rain or shine. There are less than 200 of these Lacandons, perhaps not more than 150, in the 10 or 15 villages that lie widely scattered over the 50,000 square miles of their jungle. A village, a Karibau, usually consists of four thatched huts and two related families. A big hut for the headman and his three or four wives and their children. A smaller hut for a brother or a cousin and this man's two wives. A cooking hut where an old woman lives and prepares the corn drink for the gods. And a sacred hut where the headman keeps and feeds the holy incense burners. All the men and women, and the children down to four years of age, smoke cigars made from the same kind of tobacco that the ancient Maya used. To the Lacandon's ancestors, who made these thousand-year-old drawings, smoking was a sacred ceremony. Healy found them a kindly and honest people, incapable of a lie. When he asked his interpreter to inquire why one man looked so glum, the Lacandon answered, I'm wondering when you people are going to get out of here. The Lacandon never cuts his hair. If he did cut it, he believes that a jaguar would kill him. The hair of some of the men often has a reddish tinge. A few have beards, like some of the Maya gods. But in this case, a dash of Spanish blood may be suspected. In each village, there's usually one man who makes music. But it's music as harsh and unpleasing as the smoke of the cigars. The flutes are differently tuned in the different villages, and the musicians play at random, dwelling by choice on the shriller notes. Lacandon women love ornaments and make necklaces out of seeds, red berries, mussel shells, and colored beads when they can get them. Because the men are so often killed by snakes or jaguars when hunting, polygamy has become a necessity. These two wives of one of the head men live together in harmony and share the work of the family. Girl children are betrothed at birth, but the marriage is not a fact until womanhood. Mothers make dolls for their children, but they are dolls of clay. They also make crude figures of animals that serve as playthings and pots for cooking. The animals with which the children play are not kept merely as pets, they're symbols of the family group, totem animals. Each village has a different animal totem, and its name is the name of the family. A peccary, or wild pig, a kind of rodent, called tepesquintli, a pheasant, called faisan, a parrot, or a monkey. The skull of a dead animal may be kept as a totemic symbol, but the living animal is not sacred and may be killed and eaten. Men and women must marry persons of another totemic name, and therefore of another village and family. The Lacandon hunts with bow and arrow, as his ancestors used to. He goes up trees after monkeys, and into the deepest jungles to bag a jaguar or an ocelot. Like the Maya of old, he uses an arrowhead of flint. He makes it much more quickly than you would expect. The civilization that Columbus found in America was built largely upon Indian corn. Today, the Lacandon cultivates this unique and remarkable cereal in the same way that his ancestors did, in the heart of a forest. Because the crop soon exhausts the soil, he must clear a new patch of jungle every two or three years to make a new cornfield. I wonder what's the Maya cry for timber! The time for felling trees and cutting brush is late December and early January when the dry season begins. By the middle of April, the stuff is ready to burn. Then thunderheads appear. And the rains begin. A digging stick plunged into the earth. A few kernels of corn rubbed off a cob, a bare foot covering the seed. 
In this fashion, the Maya have planted their corn since before the birth of Christ. made the civilization of a whole hemisphere is ready for harvesting. Red, yellow, white, blue, the corn is put away still in the cob, ready to feed the gods and the people and to provide seed for the next planting. Thus ends the age-old cycle of pre-Columbian agriculture to begin again with the coming of the next dry season. The women grind the starchy kernels on the same kind of milling stone their ancestors used. It's a tedious job, for a woman must grind many hours each day to produce enough cornmeal for her family's needs. From the meal, she makes tortillas, the bread of the Indian in all middle America, and bakes them on a hot stone. Like their ancestors, the Lacandons raise native cotton. The women spin it into thread by a method that goes back to the Stone Age. They set up the warp of the loom with white cotton, sometimes are dispersed with red that they have raveled out from trade goods. The loom is the same primitive type that has been used by the Maya for 2,000 years. One end stretched tight by a rope around the waist, the other fastened to a tree or post. A crude machine compared with our power looms, but one that's capable of weaving the beautiful designs that you saw the Highland women making. The Lacandon makes another kind of cloth. From the inner bark of a tree, he peels off a fibrous strip hardly more than six inches wide. He pounds it with the same sort of bark beater that the men of Africa, the South Pacific, used to make the same sort of bark cloth. Under the blows of the mallet, the strip of bark grows thinner and whiter. Then it is washed. Finally, a piece of bark cloth some two feet wide is ready to be made into a garment. Not all the villages make bark cloth. Those that do use it only in their religious ceremonies and hang it up between times in the church hut. the La Candone is a simple and peculiar one, revolving around crude clay vessels called god pots. The gods are the gods of the Maya, a few of them, but very little remains of the elaborate rituals of those ancient peoples, except the ceremonies that have to do with the burning of incense to the gods. Each village has 14 or 15 god pots, each named for a different deity. They are kept on a shelf in the sacred hut and taken down once a day when the headman of the village conducts the rite of feeding the god pots. The women play no part in the Lacandon religion except for the preparation of the holy food and the making of the pots themselves. After the clay is broken up and kneaded, it is roughly shaped into a bowl, in this case an unusually tall one. The disc that the woman is trying on for size is not a lid, but will be affixed to one side of the pot to make the face of the god with its protruding mouth. When the surface of the pot has been smoothed, it is painted white with ashes of lime, the features emphasized with black soot and with red from the anato shrub. Generally, black and red lines are added to indicate the beard, which among the Maya was an attribute of certain gods. The chief pot is for the chief of the gods, Nohochakyum, the great father, 
who dwells in the ruins of Yashtilan. To make the fire for the god pots, the Lacandon uses one of the oldest inventions of man. It takes 15 or 20 minutes to create enough heat for the friction of wood on wood to ignite the dry shavings which he uses as tinder. The old Maya books show gods and men using the same fire drill. The fire is made in order to burn copal incense, an aromatic gum which the Maya call pom. Here we see the pom being dropped into the pots. After the fire is lighted in the pots and the pom ignited, the head of the family feeds the mouths of the pots with a sacred corn broth called posola, and sometimes with a little meat. The pot is not a god, but rather a messenger to the god. To make it potent, each pot must contain a stone from an old Maya temple. Here we see a man taking out of a most important pot a piece of jade carved probably a thousand years ago. Today, the sacred stone is more apt to be merely a rough pebble picked up at a ruin where the god's spirit still rules. While the Lacandon puts incense in the pot and feeds the mouth, it's the god for good crops, good hunting, or whatever he may desire. With the feeding of the god pots go other ceremonies. There is, for example, the prayer board, with its nodules of palm incense for the living and dead members of the family group, male and female. Late in the afternoon, the head man walks into the church and prepares for the ceremony of feeding the god pots. He blows on a conch shell to summon the messenger of the god. And then he prays. I am restoring my offering of poem to you so that you in turn may restore it to the father. I am raising up my gifts to you so that you may descend and see my gifts. I am holding my gifts in my hand so that you may descend and see and learn. I am giving you incense so that you may give it to the Father, your Master. I am making gifts to you for your welfare. See me making my gifts to you, O God, so that fever may not fall upon me or upon your people. See, I am making gifts to you for the welfare of my children. May you not trample them underfoot and bring them fever. Enter and see my son. Cure him. And now the god pots are put away upon the shelf. At the end of each year, they must make new ones, and the men must go to the holy place to receive sanction for the new pots. In order to know if the time is propitious for a visit to the holy place, there are divinations with spinning twigs and the placing together of the fingers. When the time is propitious, the family departs. In this case, for Yashchilan, home of the father of the gods. They carry wood for fires on the way, supplies of food, and even a baby in a net. By creek and river, they journey five days on their way to Yashchilan. sacred city appears, or rather a part of it. For Yashchilan, one of the largest of the Maya religious centers, covers three square miles with stone temples and great sculpture. At the home of Novo Chakyum, father of the gods, the Lacandon makes fire, burns incense, and with the prayer board salutes the four directions of the earth. Then he chants. Here 
is the board with incense, with the gum of poem and the rubber tree. At daybreak, in the early morning, in the afternoon, at the beginning of the night, in all directions, with sun and shade, for many days, for many years, health is your gift. What other ruins lay buried in the jungles where the Lacandones hunted? Ely lived a year and a half in their villages and made them many gifts of beads, salt, dogs, and mirrors. But it was only when he gave them shotguns and shells that they consented to take him to other ruins than Yashchilan. There were 17 of them in all, some large, some small. One was the tallest in all Middle America, a structure rising 250 feet against a hillside. On carved stones in some of these ruins, he found the sort of glyphs that the Maya used to record dates in their very accurate calendar. In many of the buildings, there were evidences that the Lacandones had been worshiping here as at Yaschilan. Upon the floor were god pots. Finally, Healy came upon a ruin unique in prehistoric America, Bonham Park, the city of the painted temple. One of the nine buildings contained three rooms whose walls were covered with murals depicting scenes of worship, pageantry, and sacrifice painted 1,200 years ago. Through this doorway, under a lintel, also carved and painted, Healy entered a room unlike anything hitherto discovered in the land of the Maya, where only a few small or fragmentary Maya paintings had hitherto been found, Healy could see, even in the dim light, that here were entire walls recording the life of the Maya at the height of their glory. Rupert mapped the site and studied the architecture of the buildings, Stromsvik began the work of finding and raising from the jungle floor the numerous stone monuments which the Maya had carved at Bonham Park. Each stone had to be scrubbed and cleaned. Then, if by good fortune the stone had fallen face downwards, all the strange beauty of its carving could be seen and photographed. Though there are hieroglyphs on the stela, or date stone, unfortunately, they do not determine when it was erected. This stela, which was broken in three pieces, measures 18 feet in height, weighs four tons, and is the second tallest ever found. Its glyphs give the date of 672 AD. Here is another section of the stone with the upper half of a superbly carved figure. At the left is the head of an ancient Maya, whose profile agrees strikingly with that of the Lacandon beside it. This stone, which may have been part of an altar, compares in beauty of design with the finest sculpture so far discovered in Middle America. Though the walls and roof of the painted temple had resisted the destructive force of tropical vegetation, a coating of lime, translucent in spots, and in others milky, obscured large sections of the murals until they were painted with kerosene or gasoline. This wall is in room number two. An 
infrared photograph of one of the walls is the basis for this restoration. The sprawling figure shows a skill in foreshortening that was not to be equaled until the height of the Italian Renaissance, 700 years later. Here is the Mexican archaeologist and artist, Viagra, working in room number one while Healy watches. Treated with kerosene, the end wall revealed part of a unique record of Maya ceremonies painted a hundred years before the time of Charlemagne, three hundred years before the Norman conquest. Below the figures of four warriors were part of a long row of glyphs that may date the building. At the bottom of the wall could be seen a procession of musicians bearing aloft rattles and playing on other instruments. Preserved behind the coating of lime, the colors were still brilliant. You could see all the details of the Maya costumes, the patterns woven in the cloth, the jaguar skin skirts, the feather headdresses, even the jade ornaments. In another corner, Viagra is tracing on cellophane the details of the painting, which he will later transfer to paper. Tejeda, director of the National Museum in Guatemala, copies the Maya figures directly on paper. Here he is showing a lacandone, his watercolor notes on the painting at the top of the other end wall. Here is Viagra's copy of the frieze of the musicians and the dancers for whom they played. This is Tejeda's preliminary sketch of part of the dance and two trumpeters. In Guatemala, Tejeda made from his sketches and from Healy's infrared and ultraviolet photographs this 15-foot-long watercolor, showing the two triangular end walls and the two long sides of the building. These paintings, together with those in the other two rooms, cover about 1,200 square feet. They provide the finest record we have of the detail and color of costumes in the great period of Maya civilization. At the top of the end walls are aquatic deities. One is pictured as an alligator swallowing a tiger. The identity of the other is uncertain, but like the ceremony depicted in this room, it is concerned with the waters of sky and earth. Across the middle band of the murals is a court scene with three chief dignitaries and numerous courtiers. Above the head of each is a glyph block where the name of the man may have been written. The costumes are rich in detail and the headdresses fantastic in shape. Some include pendants of jade across the chest. The band of glyphs gives a date which has been interpreted as A.D. 672 by one authority and A.D. 785 by another. Above and at the right of these figures is a child, perhaps the son of the high priest ruler, carried in the arms of what appears to be a servant. Three men on this wall are evidently figures of great importance. They are being dressed for some ceremony. Each wears a skirt of jaguar skin and a headdress consisting of the mask of a god, surmounted by the green feathers of the sacred Quetzal bird. The central figure has a large frame of such feathers behind him. Two servants are completing his wardrobe by putting a jade bracelet on his right wrist and painting his body. To the right are other servants observing the investiture and talking among themselves. The position of the arm across the chest is a sign of submission or reverence. This drawing of one of the end walls shows us a group of figures which may be another view of the rulers. Here is Tejeda's painting of the end wall which you saw through the eyes of Healy's camera. We discover two umbrellas drawn in perspective and so considerately arranged by the Maya artist as to give us both a front and a side view. Along the bottom of the walls, just above the throne-like bench, we see the ceremony for which the high priests appear to have been dressed. 
A man waves his baton. All look toward the three central figures. The eyes and other portions of some figures have been destroyed, perhaps by the Maya themselves when they left Bonham Park. Now come the musicians with rattles. And an upright drum. And turtle shells beaten with forked sticks. And then dancers masked as aquatic animals, perhaps gods. Then trumpets a flute, and an ocarina. Such is the story of the Maya, the story of a civilization founded and conditioned by the cultivation of maize, one of the greatest experiments in agriculture in all human history. It is a pageant of achievement in astronomy, mathematics, and chronology. Judge this aboriginal civilization in the light of the limitations of the Stone Age, and it stands as one of the most brilliant of the accomplishments of man.